Hello and welcome. My name is Alexandra Supper, and I'm the program director of the Bachelor Program in Arts and Culture. Arts and Culture is one of the four bachelor programs that we have at the Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences of Maastricht University, the others being Digital Society, European Studies, and Global Studies. However, in the next half hour, I would like to really zoom in on just one of those, namely the Bachelor in Arts and Culture. And in doing so, I will also get some help along the way from some students in our program to give you more first-hand experience of what it means to study in our program. The Bachelor in Arts and Culture is a three-year bachelor program which can be studied only full-time. Uh, full-time means there's an expectation that you would spend about 40 hours a week studying. Some of that time will be spent in classes. We work a lot with smaller group tutorials of about 15 students supported by a tutor. And then there's, of course, some lectures as well um, to help your learning process. But a lot of the time will also be spent studying and preparing on your own, preparing for these classes. Um, so there's a lot of reading in the program in particular. So if you like reading, that's great news, I think. Especially as uh, we read a lot of very interesting stuff. Uh, I would hope that you would agree there. Um, we touch upon a wide range of themes that are relevant to understand our contemporary Western society and culture. Um, I say Western society and culture because that really is our focus point in this program. However, I do think it is important to understand that in its kind of global context. So we do pay attention to historical processes of colonialism, for instance, as well as more contemporary globalization processes as well um, to understand um, this society better. Um, and when I talk about arts and culture, I think it's important to emphasize that we think about these in quite broad terms. So it's not just about art and literature, but also about the domains such as media, science and technology, and politics. And in particular about the way in which all of these kind of come together uh, and interact with each other in our contemporary society. Um, and uh, we take a very interdisciplinary approach, which is quite characteristic for our program. Um, we include perspectives in particular from humanities uh, disciplines such as history, philosophy, um, art and literature studies, um, but also from the qualitative uh, social sciences. Um, and uh, so that's the kind of approaches that we take. And I think it's nice also to think about that in terms of a concrete example. And I think a, a, a good example of that is one of the pressing societal issues of our time, which is climate change, um, which is a really interesting uh, subject to study from an arts and cultural perspective. Uh, because on the one hand, we have this overwhelming, seemingly overwhelming scientific consensus that has emerged about um, the nature of, the, of the, the way in which the climate is changing. But there's also a lot of societal controversy about it. And so it's really a sphere where science, politics, media and art kind of mingle with each other. And I'd like to just uh, think through with you what it would mean to study a debate like that from an arts and culture perspective. Um, as an example. And I think it's nice here to start with an artistic example as our starting point. Um, in early 2019, an online database, database was launched called Watercolor World. And this was unveiled with quite a lot of media attention. Um, and in part because it promised to be not just a great resource for, for lovers of watercolor paintings, uh, but rather also a resource for environmentalists and conservationists who are interested in documenting the long-term effects of climate change. Um, so the promise made here was that um, um, watercolor paintings are a kind of genre um, for which we have uh, quite a long history of people documenting their natural environment, going back far longer, for instance, than we have systematic photographic recordings or systematic measurements of temperatures. And therefore, the idea is that you could use these watercolor paintings to trace how particular environments changed over time. Think, for instance, of erosion of coastlines and other phenomena um, that you can capture um, over time. And so the promise made here was this could be a resource not just for art lovers, but also for scientists and experts. 
Um, and um, as such, I think it's a really nice example um, of um, this kind of arts and culture approach in which art, media and science come together in a kind of politically charged environment. Um, but I think it's also good to go beyond that one specific example and think more broadly about what are questions that a student of arts and culture might ask of the debates of, about uh, climate change. And I think one important question to raise here is who are the actors in these debates? Who are the ones who get to speak up? Who are the ones who are listened to? What arguments uh, do they make on the basis of this platform that they are given? And also, how do new actors try to enter this kind of uh, debate? Um, so there's, of course, long-standing traditional actors such as scientists studying climate and uh, politicians making decisions that have an impact uh, on our environment, but also more recently, for instance, a really loud voice in that debate has been um, um, students uh, who took to the street to make their voice heard. There are other actors as well who are maybe not heard so much in these debates, who do not get to speak for themselves, for instance, because they are busy fleeing from environmental devastation that has been unleashed on uh, on their home country and their home territory. Um, so I think it's important to ask who gets to speak up in a debate like th that. And if they get to speak up, if they are heard, um, how do they use their voice? And an important part here, I think, is also to ask about the power of representations, the power of images, for instance, whether those images are scientific graphs or uh, photographs such as these famous photos of um, polar bears um, whose um, natural environment and, and sort of life world is melting away, or whether they are, for instance, artistic representations. So how do people make use of various forms of images to make visible some kind of reality about the way in which our environment is changing? So how are these images also enlisted um, as some kind of indication that the, uh, that, uh, the climate is changing? But also, on the other hand, how are representations used to downplay this kind of effect, to keep that controversy alive? So these are just some of the kinds of examples that's, uh, of questions that students of arts and culture might ask of um, our climate change debates. The reason I've approached this in terms of questions rather than in terms of answers has a lot to do with the approach to learning that we take at Maastricht University. Uh, we take this pedagogical approach of problem-based learning, which is a very active student-led approach that always begins with formulating some learning goals, some questions to be answered of the reading material, of the study material that you encounter. Um, and this is very characteristic of problem-based learning, that you first learn how to phrase questions in a productive manner, and then, of course, you also do your best to answer them in a collaborative process, uh, together with your other students, and, of course, supported also uh, by tutors and lecturers along the way as well. And um, when we talk problem-based learning, I think it's also really nice um, to hear from some of our students how they experience this process, which is a question that I've asked to Hind, who's a student in her second year, as well as to Roxana, who's currently in the third year of the Bachelor in Arts and Culture. They will tell us how they experience problem-based learning as a student. PBL for me is a great way not only to interact with uh, my classmates, but also uh, to engage in a more proactive way with the tasks and the topics that we are discussing, because we often tackle our own life experiences, which gives us the chance to express our own opinions in a safe space. Besides, the structure of a PBL tutorial forces you to stay attentive and therefore up to date with the material. And of course, it's amazing to be able to choose what research will be done and what questions will be answered for the next tutorial. I experience PBL to be very helpful, especially because you really understand the things you're learning. Um, it's because you have to explain them to others and you discuss them in the group. Um, in order to be able to do so, you really need to understand what you're talking about. Um, but also if there's something you don't understand, you can just ask the group and they explain it to you and you figure it out. And that's a really nice learning environment. And what I also like is that it's fun. 
especially in arts and culture, where you discuss societal issues from different perspectives in an international classroom, uh, it can be really interesting, yeah. Thanks so much, Hind and Roxana, for sharing your experiences. Um, Roxana, in her answer, already touched upon the international classroom in which you would be studying if you came to study arts and culture. Usually we have about 110 or 120 students starting in starting our program every year, and the majority of them are not Dutch. Of course, there are quite a lot of, uh, of course, Dutch students are among the uh, um, sort of more strongly represented groups, as are the neighboring countries of Germany and Belgium. But really, we have quite a global community. Um, so some recent numbers, for instance, show 23 different nationalities. Uh, which I think is quite impressive. Um, and it really shows how in this problem-based learning approach, you really have a lot of different perspectives and backgrounds coming to, together to discuss these issues. Our teaching staff is also quite international. I'm an embodiment of that as well, um, seeing as I come from Austria originally before settling in the Netherlands. Um, and our program is taught in English. That's the, the kind of... Uh, um, language in which you'd be taught. However, for students who are fluent in Dutch, it is also possible to write your exam and your papers in Dutch and also to um, develop your academic writing skills in Dutch as well. Um, so there's a lot of diversity, um, but there's also a lot of structure. And in particular, the elementary phase of our program, so that's the first year and a half, is quite strongly structured in the sense that all students follow the same courses in order to develop a kind of shared knowledge base, shared uh, frame of reference, uh, um, and, and so on. Um, in the later phase of their, uh, of their uh, program, students can then make their own choices about what to specialize in. Um, so in this second half of the program, there is some room to make choices, to follow your own interests, um, to put your own kind of focal points as well. And in all this, you would be supported by a member of, an, of our academic staff acting as your mentor, um, who in the first year helps you to get settled in university life um, and get used to studying academically and later on also supports you in making these choices uh, about what to focus on and about your future as well. Um, and I think before I show you some details of how our curriculum is set up, I think it's nice to look at another example. And that's an example that has held, held the world in its grip uh, uh, in, in the last year for sure. Um, COVID-19 certainly is uh, a very, very um, important uh, challenge to our society at the moment. And again, I'd like to uh, think through with you what it means to study uh, something like COVID-19 from an arts and culture perspective. COVID-19 for sure raises ethical questions. These are questions, for instance, of what kind of responsibility we have for each other in our society, how to protect vulnerable groups. Um, when it comes to a vaccine, for instance, once that's developed, who should have access to it first? Um, what kind of responsibility do we have for each other here? There are questions about the status of scientific knowledge and about uh, expertise. These are not just questions about what do we know about the pandemic, but also questions about who counts as an expert and who listens to them, who takes their advice seriously. And how are then political decisions made also on the basis of this kind of expert knowledge? Um, how is, uh, for instance, a lockdown or a partial lockdown politically justified and also contested? Um, there are questions, of course, about the role of the arts. Uh, the artistic sector has been hit very hard by the pandemic, that's for sure. Um, it's uh, led to uh, the threat of a lot of livelihoods. Uh, but also, how can artists, uh, how have artists responded to this crisis and how can they perhaps, through the work that they do, help us to make sense of the pandemic, to help, help us make sense of our experiences of this pandemic as well? Um, then there are questions about technology, of course. The very fact that I'm uh, recording this uh, lecture here, this open day lecture, instead of um, 
doing it in the historic buildings of our faculty uh, with you in the audience in person, I think is a very, uh, very good example of the way that technology and media have been used uh, to enable social interactions during um, uh, the conditions of the pandemic. Um, but there are questions here about um, the, the role of these technologies as well, how they perhaps will also stay with us uh, afterwards um, and so on. And then there are questions about uh, cultural groups and how different cultural groups feel the effects of the pandemic differently and what kind of tensions, for instance, arise in our multicultural society in which uh, different groups might deal with the pandemic in different ways. These are some of the kinds of questions that we might ask of this pandemic. Um, the keywords that I have um, put on the slides here map onto some of the main themes that you touch upon in the courses uh, of, our in, of our elementary phase of the program. So each of them is a sort of thematic focus in a different um, course of our program. Of course, the pandemic will not always be at the center of everything that you learn, but uh, each of these courses contributes something um, to, the, to our ability um, to understand um, this pandemic. And so our uh, elementary phase is structured um, according to these sort of core themes. Um, here you now see the same course titles that were on the previous slide uh, um, positioned in the order in which you would take these courses. Um, so each of them has a different thematic focus, but there's also a kind of historical development, a chronological development running through uh, these courses. So we really start with this idea that to understand our uh, Western society and culture, we have to understand its historical origins as well. And so there is uh, also a kind of historical thread running through our program. Um, so that's the kind of setup of the elementary phase. Alongside these thematic courses, there's also a number of skills that you develop along the way, starting with the very important skill of learning how to read academic texts from a number of different disciplines, um, such as history, philosophy, qualitative social sciences, for instance, that stands at the very beginning of the skills trajectory. And then you learn different kinds of skills related to, for instance, finding and evaluating sources, but also methodological skills, such as doing conceptual analysis, analyzing pieces of uh, artworks and uh, literary works, ethnographic methods such as interviewing and doing participant observations, and discourse analysis. These are the central uh, kinds of methodological approaches that play a role in our program. And we also have a very strong focus on developing your research and writing skills through a trajectory in research and writing, or for those students who develop who want to develop their Dutch writing skills, uh, instead of the research and writing trajectory, you can follow the onderzoeks- en schrijfvaardigheden. Um, so this is offered in both English as well as in Dutch. Um, in the second half of your studies, I already mentioned, you can make some choices of what to focus on. And here, again, these different domains of uh, culture play an important role in our program as we offer a number of different electives. You can see the six course titles here on the slides. And um, each of those courses starts with a particular um, uh, contemporary societal challenge and looks at them, tries to understand it at the intersection between two of these main domains. Um, students can set their own focus points uh, in the program by choosing two out of these six electives that we have on offer. Um, at the same time, it is also uh, in, in the second half of your program, you also deepen some of your methodological and research skills as well as, um, as encroaching, uh, as embarking on new kind of thematic explorations. In the third year, then, uh, students can also uh, make some choices again. Um, in fact, the fifth semester, uh, you choose entirely yourself how you want to fill this. A lot of students go to study abroad at one of 
almost we have about a hundred different partner universities to choose from. Uh, uh, but there are also students who gain some practical experience through an internship. And there's also some really exciting minors available within Maastricht University that students can take in this fifth semester. Um, and then in the second half of year three, um, there's a number of different courses to prepare you for the research process. And then you would uh, really spend a few months focusing on your bachelor thesis on a subject that is very dear to your heart. Um, that really interests you. Um, and once again, I think it will be really interesting to hear from some of our uh, uh, students um, how they experience this third year. Uh, I decided to do an internship during the fifth semester, um, especially because I wasn't quite sure about my career choice. Uh, so I thought it might be nice to get some practical work experiences. Um, so I worked at a museum for about four months and I, I was part of the exhibition realization and I found that really interesting, especially to have this practical addition to the bachelor program because it was an opportunity for me to apply the knowledge I acquired and that was really fun and it also helped me to get clear on my future plans. For my fifth semester I went on exchange in Germany with the Erasmus program. As I'm half Belgian, half German, it was a way to reconnect with my German's origins and be able to learn properly the language and practice it on a daily basis. I went to the Bauhaus University in Weimar, which is a small city in what used to be East Germany. It was a great experience because I met amazing people and discovered a different way of living as well. Uh, it was really interesting because I was in, in a very historical um, city, uh, would it be for its university or for the political history of the city. So I would recommend it 100%. Um, so we've talked about the third year. Um, which is the final year of the bachelor. So this is also a good moment to briefly think about what are the qualities that our graduates have. Um, our program trains you uh, uh, to develop a thorough understanding of a number of very important current societal issues and to understand these in terms of their historical roots and developments, but also in terms of their contemporary cultural meanings. Um, you learn how to approach a problem from a number of different perspectives, in particular, of course, of these intersections of the different cultural domains that, that we uh, focus on. I think it's really important that it's not just about being able to take different perspectives, but also being able to combine them with each other and to build bridges between them. This is something that you really would learn if you studied in our program. And then, of course, there are a number of important practical skills. Um, we pay a lot of attention to uh, writing, academic writing, professional writing. Um, these are skills that you really develop and strengthen in our program. And there's also a lot of presentation skills that you develop. And more generally, I think our problem-based learning approach means that you're always actively communicating about what you're learning. And that prepares you uh, for skills such as moderating and chairing, um, presenting uh, different points of views, uh, bringing them together, and so on. So these are important qualities that our graduates have. And then, of course, the question is, what do they then go on to do with these uh, 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 skills? And once again, I think this is a good question to also ask uh, our uh, students uh, here. I do not have any concrete career plans for um, the future after my graduation, which is not a problem because I'm just halfway through my bachelor's. Uh, but for this reason, I am very looking forward to the electives next, the next semester and my semester abroad because it will give me the chance indeed to uh, explore more subjects and more fields and to test myself so that I can make a pondered uh, choice in my career path. Uh, yeah, I kind of already touched on it when I talked about my internship. So I would like to work in a museum later on, but I think I'm first gonna do a master's uh, somewhere in the field of museum studies. I haven't chosen a specific one yet because I basically just finished the internship. Um, yeah, but after graduation I will do a master's. 
When I finished my studies, I would like to become a reporter. At least that was my dream when I started arts and culture, and this is still my dream today. But on the road, I discovered I was really interested by international relations. Uh, and I think Maastricht was a good beginning, a good stepping stone to, to go in that direction. So right now, I'm following a master that would enable me to go in the two direction, or at least to have the choice when I finish my studies. Um, well, I hope everything will go well, but I'm sure that arts and culture gave me the tools to go in either direction that I really like. Thank you so much uh, uh, for sharing these experiences. Uh, let's also have a look at a kind of graphical representation here. Um, what you see here is what our recent graduates ended up um, doing after they finished uh, their program. What you can see is that a lot of our, uh, of our graduates go on to do a master's degree. Many of them stay within the Netherlands, uh, but they also go abroad and they do master's degrees in quite a wide variety of different kinds of uh, fields and disciplines. Um, but also, um, some of them also don't do a, ma a master's program, but rather start to work right away in the Netherlands or abroad. Um, and the kind of domains that students go into, sometimes immediately, more often after having done the master program, include fields such as journalism, politics and government, uh, cultural organizations, media, the education sector, research, non-governmental uh, organizations. There's a wide variety of different kind of job titles uh, that, our, that our students hold, but these are some of the most popular domains that they go into. Um, I did mention that many of them do continue to do a master first. Um, we have quite a lot of exciting offers within our own faculty. You see a list of our master programs that we have here, but also quite a lot of our students go on to do a master's program at other universities, both within the Netherlands and elsewhere. There's a large variety of different kinds of choices available. Some students choose to then deepen in a more disciplinary uh, uh, master, um, such as, for instance, um, philosophy or history. Some of them uh, go into uh, more applied fields like communication studies or also museum studies, for instance. This is something that um, Roxana, who spoke earlier about her experiences, is considering going into. So there's a wide variety of different options available. Now, with all this, I hope that I've given you an interesting glimpse into our program. Um, if you are interested in applying, there's some important uh, practical information on this slide. You can, of course, also find that elsewhere in our platforms. Um, please, um, please make sure that you're aware of all these deadlines and that you also take note of the contact details in case you have further questions about the application procedures or about studying at, at FASOS. Uh, if you already want to meet some fellow students, you might also want to consider joining the Facebook community. Welcome to FASOS. Some details on this uh, here as well. Um, and yes, I hope that this gave you a nice uh, idea of what our program is all about. I suspect that you might still have some questions. We have online question and answer sessions um, at our open days where I will be, but so will be some of our students as well. So I hope that you will join us with all your questions um, there. Thanks a lot for listening. <laughs>